Hello and welcome to Taking You to School with Dr. Tom Pritchard. I am your host, J.P. John Paz from the two-man power trip of wrestling. And of course, joining me here is the star of the show, the former eight-time Smoky Mountain Wrestling <clears throat> World Tag Team Champion, former WB World Tag Team Champion, and one of the greatest trainers ever in the history of the business, the Doctor of Desire himself, Tom Pritchard. Dr. Tom, how are you doing today, sir? Doing great, John. Thank you very much. It's always a great day here in Knoxville, Tennessee, as usual. Just in the fall setting, I'm not really a happy camper, but uh, everything else is great. Did you notice I snuck in Smoky Mountain World Tag Team Champion? Even of course though it's not, you did. Yeah, even though it's not a World Tag Team title, yeah. That is one thing that makes the hair on the neck of my the back of, the the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Yeah, when you get all these, uh, I'm a World Champion of Georgia. No, you not So right, not possible. Yes, not, not possible. Not. Yes, but yeah. Although Smoky Mountain was a great territory, it just wasn't global. Well, let me just say this. Uh, to the world, you may be one person, but to one person, you may be the world. So in Knoxville, Tennessee, or in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, we probably were the world champions to some people. So You got to think that you love Smoky Mountain, though. I mean, something about it made you stay there. Glenn, too. Yeah, well, it, it really is nice. But once again, you know, our daughter was going to UT, and uh, that was the main drawback here. And my wife has... Uh, uh, family here uh, with her sister, and so it's great. I mean, yeah, and I like the atmosphere. I love the place. I really, really do. I and anybody that comes to Knoxville usually falls in love with it and stays most of the time. Yeah, because I guess Glenn's from wherever he's from. He ends up in Knoxville for Smoky Mountain, and then he never leaves. Yeah, I mean, and he found uh, Crystal, his wife here too. So uh, there is an allure here if you let it allure you to here. I guess. Allow myself to introduce myself, that kind of stuff. Yes. Yeah. For Smoky Mountain, I was just thinking, did you see Dark Side? I know we talked about it briefly. You hadn't seen this episode yet with the focus on Bruiser Bedlam, a.k.a. Johnny K-9. <clears throat> I have not seen it yet, no, but I knew a lot about Johnny K-9 when he got here. And uh, we were also talking about this. He was, um, man, he was a lot of fun if, if, if. Again, if you're if you're on uh, the right side of, of his law, so to speak. So, I, I know all about the uh, blowing up a police station. I thought I thought that was kind of might have been fabricated. And the more I got to know him, no, no, I don't believe that was fabricated at all. He was a real deal. He had uh, true to the crew tattooed on his stomach and i asked him one time if it was a motley crew and, and that's when he started telling me about being in prison and uh uh those were his uh compadres so yeah it, it it's it's funny how a, a business like professional wrestling draws in people like that huh how about that i, I saw something the other day that said i feel so bad for those that never went crazy what a miserable life they must live you know and i thought yeah because you got to let it all go sometimes. You only live once. And for guys like Johnny K-9, he not only lived once, but he was on the fast track. He was raising hell, and, and he didn't care. Man, that episode was crazy. might have been the best episode so far this season because there was no agendas or no BS involved. It was just a straight story about his crazy-ass life. And Scott Demore was great on the episode, too, as was, of course, our longtime close personal friend Jim Cornette was great on the episode as well but it was just funny like to think like okay this guy is a criminal somewhat mastermind but he's also a pro wrestler over here for smoky mountain he's beating macho man randy savage he's blowing up police stations i mean crazy whirlwind well, of life it, it's like peanut butter and jelly actually if you think about it i mean uh yeah jimmy look at, at that time especially talent was talent where <laughs> you get it and uh i think I don't know to what extent Jim knew the activities that old Bruiser might have been involved in. But, um, look, when he came here, for all I know, I, I don't know if he committed any illegalities while he was here in, in the Great Smoky Mountains. But while he was here, he was a hell of a, hell of a guy to have on the card, hell of a guy to be around uh, in the locker room. And, um, uh, you know, that's that's how we judged him. He not not condoning or not uh, dismissing any of the horrible things I'm sure he's done, including murder. Uh, but 
you know, I don't know what else. I, I, I find myself almost feeling like if I say anything good about this guy, I'm endorsing what he did or endorsing his uh, personality or his, um, uh, you know, commitments of mayhem. But the fact is, um, I didn't know him from those days. I knew him from the days when he was here in in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And while he was here, he was um, nothing but but an ideal employee and an ideal wrestler. And one of the guys that was uh, fun to be around on the road and just uh, uh, colorful, rambunctious, uh, tough, and liked to tell stories. Uh, you know, we knew he had a colorful life. We knew he had... Things in his past that I'm sure he didn't want to talk about and didn't, but he talked about some. So, uh, again, one of those guys who we don't know the circumstances. I don't – let me say this. I don't know the circumstances. I haven't seen Dark Side of the Ring, and I'm sure they brought up what happened and uh, how it happened and what led to it happening. But I don't know what led to it happening. I don't know the uh, circumstances. I just knew him for a very brief time. And in that time, uh, we actually went up, um, Al Snow and myself teamed, or maybe it was Bruiser and myself teamed, um, against Mickey Doyle, or yeah, Mickey Doyle and maybe Scott Demore in Mickey's retirement match. And uh, I, I remember, you know, again, Bruiser being up there and we just uh, talking and having a good time. Um, so I, I don't know that um, I've ever seen the other side of it. I know it was always there, and I think he just kept it in a special pocket and didn't reveal it until it was time. I feel like he would have definitely hidden that stuff or not told Cornette, obviously, uh, about that sort of stuff. In the documentary, Cornette basically no, he doesn't believe it, but he didn't know what was going on because then he right. wouldn't have had him beat Bullet Bob and, and beat Randy Savage, which was nuts. And I remember I talked to Cornette years ago about this. I was like, I can't believe you had him beat Macho Man. I can't, but, and then I, he, you know, he says in the documentary as well, Macho Man said he'd rather lose because he's coming in and out and Bedlam is right. going to be like a, a guy getting a push. So it was Macho Man's idea to lose. So I was like, wow, look at Macho Man. Both well, yeah. Guys. Yeah. And, and I think uh, Randy probably saw him as, uh, that guy too, because Randy, Randy was a bit of an outlaw himself in, in a lot of ways, and and I'm not saying as far as uh, old Bruiser Bedlam might have crossed the line in, but Randy, I think, understood. Here's a guy who looks this way, is the part. Uh, he's going to be here for a while, and Randy's not. So the the business thing to do would be put this guy over and help your territory be stronger. And kudos to Randy for doing that. And um, hell, kudos to Bob Armstrong for doing that too, because Bob knew too. Bob knew the deal, and and it was always about trying to make the the territory you're working in stronger. That made perfect sense. Now I couldn't find anything with you working with him at Smoky Mountain. Did you work with him at Smoky Mountain at all? I don't believe so. Uh, not against him, but we we did stand, and I told this story, gosh, a few times, but. One of, one of the uh, few times I got Jim really mad at me, and, and he did too, we were out, uh, Cornette was cutting a promo, and it was myself and Bruiser, and, and it might have been Del Rey in the background too, but it was mainly me and Bruiser who were cutting up, so to speak, and we were talking back and forth, and we were making faces, and we were you know, talking amongst ourselves, and we got a little too loud, and Cornette turned around and gave us both the death stare. <laughs> and when we got back to the locker room, he says, God dang it, guys, now i got to recut that whole thing over. You can't be effing around when I'm out there talking and cutting this promo. He had so many points he had to get across. He was trying to remember. Stressful day at TV. And, uh, you know, he was he was hot at us. But but he got over it. You know, it's just one of those things. But that's what I mean. He would just start uh, – we just start uh, – not thinking about, yeah, not thinking about business, and, and Jimmy was. So, you know, I, I mean, uh, yeah, that was – Jimmy might not have known. Jimmy might not have known the whole – the full extent of the guy. I don't know. I don't. I really don't know how he even came in contact with him. Might have been uh, – do they say that mm -hmm. on the documentary? Yep. How, did, how did Jimmy find him? 
Cornette saw him on an indie show, basically. There you and go. And was like, this guy, because I think he may have remembered him mm-hmm. from being a jobber for the WWF, but obviously mm-hmm. he changed his look. I mean, he got a lot bigger and yeah. a lot, you know, much better look to him so right. he saw him on an indie show or something and really came across and was like i want to book this guy for smoke him out i can make him a big heel in the territory well then yeah then that makes perfect sense because you don't really go into the guy's background at, at a show where you know you're not <laughs> he doesn't really know you and you don't really know him but uh that was part of the thing probably just judging on on his work judging on his look judging on just uh face value if you can come in and help us um and you paid your debt to society then you know why not other people have done it too so do you remember him at all in wbf johnny k9 as being a job guy i don't i honest to goodness don't um the only time i really remember and i met him in smoky mountain but that's that's where i know him uh uh from from what he did um and in the ring and things like that. So and he was, he was, I thought he was talented. I thought he had a great ring presence. Uh, certainly unpredictable. And certainly one of those guys that, that you wanted on your card, if you wanted credibility, because he was authentic. He was a real deal as obviously uh, everybody found out later, you know, you have to be the real deal to do what he did and then get in the ring and not play a character. That was, the character front and back. I mean, out, out in front of the people and backstage, he was that guy. He was, uh, uh, he was crazy and it wouldn't sound so far fetched to know that he might've been involved in uh, extracurricular activities and outside the law type things. So I think it, I, I think I would, I'm going to go out on a limb and I say, I think it happens in, everyday life too where people are having an ordinary life and next thing you know uh they find 30 bodies under the under the uh, house i mean how does that happen but it happens and they always say like the neighbor oh he was such a nice guy I, yeah such a guy. nice yeah. <laughs> I, I never i never saw it coming yeah. so yeah i mean the same thing so before the uh just say no or no movement or me too movement gets on there and say look yeah i think everybody is uh deserving of a second chance sometimes a third and i don't know jimmy even knew about the first time or or the full reputation so well obviously he didn't he said it on dark side yeah he had no idea yeah but you know he 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 was look overall he was great talent he was he was a great addition for what he did in smoky mountain that's that's my take on it though to me, that's just crazy. It's like you could be a wrestler, but then you keep going back to the life of crime. Obviously, for whatever reason, he maybe he thought he could make more money there or maybe he thought he could do wrestling on the side. But it always seemed like it's going to the documentary. He's always going back to Satan's Choice Biker Gang. He's doing this. Even one of the guys told him, listen, get out of here and go wrestle or something because it seems like you're getting a push and maybe you can make it to WWF one day or something. They, they were tra- almost trying to push him out. They saw some talent there, but he just kept coming back and back to it. Well, sometimes you, you, you can take the boy out of the jail, but you can't take the jail out of the boy. I mean, uh, sometimes it's just in you. And, you know, I've lived my, as an example, I've lived my life the way I have for a long time now. And uh, I don't know that I know how to do it any different. And maybe that was where John was too. You just, you've been doing it. I, I don't know how long he'd had us this checkered, past i'm sure it started early because i don't think you just suddenly go join a biker gang and start killing people but you have to look back and see what triggered it and what what did it and uh you know sometimes you can't get it out of your system and sometimes you just can't can't connect the way you need to connect and uh i don't know i can sit here and psychoanalyze him all day long but i have no clue uh what made him do the things he did all I know is my time around him. It was a it was a great time. It was a lot of fun, and uh, he was good. To, he was good to me. That's all I can say. They actually had some footage. I'm sure it was Cornette. Some backstage Smoky Mountain stuff of Cornette and Bruiser Bedlam, and like Jimmy Del Rey and stuff, hanging out, laughing, joking around, and stuff. Wow, well, was I not there laughing and joking around? I don't think so. I didn't see you, man. That could have been one of those days I didn't feel like laughing or joking around. So, you know, but yeah, that's what I'm saying, man. He was, he would, he could be very funny. He could be very entertaining. 
and a big guy who looks like that, you know, hey, Jimmy's, hey, hey, do these uh, do these trunks need to be washed? I mean, he hadn't washed them for a month. What do you think? And and they'd just be rank, and he thought that was funny, but, I mean, nobody wants to work with a guy who's stinking. He would go in the locker room, he'd, he'd wash them out in the sink. But, you know, <laughs> other than that, <laughs> you know, other than just being stinking and beefing every time you come in, I mean, it really wasn't that bad. But, uh yeah, I, there was no reason to bring up his past unless he brought it up. And and uh, why would you? Why would you? Even Scott Demore, who was really close with him, he kind of seemed like he had no idea. Because, you know, he, he saw him beat up, rough up a promoter a time or two that, that shorted mm-hmm. him on money. But he never thought, like, no, my friend's a killer or my friend blew up a police station for real. Like, he just, I guess, didn't look at him in that light. And I can see that, too. You don't want to look at somebody you like in that light. You don't want to look at, at somebody you enjoy being around just thinking that they could be capable of such heinous crimes or or uh, doing these these crazy things and get away with it. So uh, as far as a wrestler, Johnny Canine was, was, had the perfect look. Not Johnny Canine, but Bruiser Bedlam. Johnny Canine obviously didn't have the right look time but as he got older and as he uh bulked up um yeah he looked he looked like a badass and uh true to form most people who get over uh who aren't playing a part are just an extension of themselves so if that was a part of bruiser bedlam and he knew how to bring it to the uh working world of professional wrestling then he was an asset because you you need guys like that with credibility. And then you need guys like Randy Savage and Bob Armstrong who are willing to put him over and uh, give him more credibility because they understood business. So, uh, yeah, I, I think whatever they had on dark side, I don't have to watch it, but whatever they had on the dark side, I, I'm, I'm anxious. I'm curious to see because the, the little bit I did know, Told me he was crazy, but I'd like to. I'm sure there's a lot more to the story. And the ratings, I believe it was uh, up from the week before, but still down overall. It just seemed like um, ratings not that great for Vice TV for right now, for whatever. Well, reason. I was just going to say, you know, what what season is this? A two? Season three. Season three. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, you know, I I I, I don't know if it. Uh, if TV shows, especially, keep keep getting better or keep getting more interesting or less interesting or whatever it may be, but um, it could be the season, it could be football, it could be a lot of things. I don't, I I can make all the excuses too, but maybe they just didn't know enough about Bruiser Bedlam. Maybe it wasn't plugged. I don't. Maybe, Thursday yeah, night football be. is back. They, got huh? Thursday night, they do have Thursday night football. It's back. It is true. And it, that mm-hmm. dark side is on Thursday. Could be, uh, you know, could yeah. be. Yeah. So yeah, it it, it I, I like the fact that they're actually uh Dark Side of the Ring are actually going and investigating some of this stuff. I just ah uh, I'm gonna leave it right there. Sometimes they go a little a little too much, but it was good to hit, get his uh, his widow was on uh, Johnny Canine's widow. She told some good stuff. She basically was saying that he was murdered. And uh, that he didn't just die of a heart attack. But the cops were saying it seemed like a bit of a heart attack. Obviously, he lived a crazy lifestyle that a lot of different was, was he locked up when he died? Yep, I believe so, yes. Oh, well, uh, yeah. Well, you never know. I mean, because yeah. <laughs> crazy things happen behind walls, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hey. Look at Brian Lawler. Yeah, there. Yeah, there's there's more than more than one. I mean, there, there's <laughs> we can go down a rabbit hole on that too. But the, <laughs> there, there, there's a oh, man. <laughs> yeah, I just I just I just know that um, I uh, yeah I just know it's a, it's a crazy world out there these days. But it was a lot more fun, a lot, lot more crazy in a fun way uh, in the eighties and the nineties, and. People don't want to hear that because they they believe they know they know they believe they know what it's like when uh, Flair is out there cutting a a cocaine fueled promo. That's that's the one that always makes you laugh when they say, "Boy, Rick is all coked up and he's cutting a promo." I know for a fact. 
<laughs> Rick doesn't do drugs. His drug was alcohol. He was not a cocaine pill guy, pot, any of that stuff. And th that's where when when everybody loses their credibility when they start talking about the cocaine fueled promo. Yeah. 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 Nobody has a clue. It's like saying, I saw a shoot. He was a shoot knowing him. You wouldn't know a shoot if you fell right in front of you. You would have not a clue. I don't mean you, but I mean in general. Right. And um so <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 it gets crazy on that deal. You know, were we were we nuts back then? Of course. But man, again, I always say this: if you if you never lost your head, you never followed your heart, and you got to do that, man. And sometimes it's just that that insanity and craziness of the business that draws in what it draws in, and that's why it was drawing so many eyes and interest when you had those legitimate, authentic lunatics loving lovingly but also dangerously uh, and authentically coming and performing. And I, I say obviously because uh, Bruiser Bedlam became a, a tremendous performer. He was a great heel. He was a guy who would go in and bump. He was a guy who knew how to sell. So uh, he, he was a product of whatever his life, whatever in life, happened before and and we all have to look at what what we were living in growing up there's no you can't blame your circumstances for who you turn out to be but you can certainly look at them and say well this is i was molded or i was triggered by and um i i, I know there have been people who've had worse lives and worse circumstances come out and be geniuses and gone to college and did some great things. But um, professional wrestling, it's not like we're uh, trying to get our master's or uh, degrees in anything except entertainment and go out there and uh, show people a good time and, and have a good time while we're in the ring too. I believe that's why everybody should be in it. If it's not fun, then you might want to find a, a different occupation and you probably make a lot more money so today i really wanted to talk a, a little bit about randall keith orton randy orton as you would know him as i'm always curious because sometimes you get credited for being a part of talent relations and bringing him in sometimes you don't were you a part of i think you were right part of talent yeah. relations that brought him in so who technically is responsible for bringing him in him himself because of his father or was that talent relations really bringing him in well i i believe it was this is this was my understanding because i took randy over to the ring in the studio when he came in uh for the first day just to get a look at him good looking kid obviously and we went over to the studio and he was, and he, was he really was a great kid he really a, a great guy just, just uh, to be living in the shadow of Bob Orton Jr., uh, great guy. And he, we were talking, and he said his dad didn't want him working in the little outlaw shows that were around St. Louis at the time because they would go to these backyard shows, and they would play wrestler and do all this stuff. And um, Randy – had talent and I think his dad knew it and his dad wanted him to get us get to be seen and get an opportunity in WWE before it was too late before he got too old or or piddled around wasted his life and then he didn't have an opportunity but uh as far as bringing him in that day that was JR or whoever Bob talked to and then I was the one who came back and said yeah this kid's got it not that that was the thing that sealed his fate or sealed him getting a contract. But every time someone would come in and they would ask what I thought after working with him, I'd say, yeah, this guy has it right now. Or, well, this guy has potential, but he really needs a lot of work. If he can pick it up, great. Or this guy, I don't know. Um, it's up to you guys because, and it's always up to them, but it's up to you guys because this is going to be, a, this is going to be definitely a, uh, uh, a road, a hard road to go down for this because a lot of people coming in didn't get it and first time working out, but um, uh, he looked great. But it's going to take it's going to take some time with this guy, and that's what we would 
determined to either wait or Vance loves his loves his look. Let's go with it and give him six months to a year and see what happens. So, but Randy in the beginning uh, had the size, had the temperament. He knew how to lock up. He knew how to work uh, without even knowing he knew how to work. He followed. He was a natural. It was uh, like Batista when Batista came in for the first time to work out. He had worked with Alpha. He had trained with Alpha. He had a clue. He knew how to lock up light. He was coachable. So that that was how that worked. Um, I wasn't the one who called up Randy or I wasn't the one that Bob talked to. But if it was JR, then cool. But I was the one who took him over to the studio the first time and got in the ring with him in WWE. When Bob Orton calls, is that like, uh, wow, Bob Orton's son? Like, is everybody like kind of surprised by? It? Obviously, everyone knows how good of a worker where he was and what a talent. So it's like, we well, let's pay attention to this because he might be onto something. Well, I, I think I, I don't believe it was that. I believe it was let's let's see what he's got. It's it's the same thing with any any second or third generation wrestler coming in. You're not obviously, you know, there've been a lot of great wrestlers. Um, with with sons and daughters who did well. And then there's a lot of great wrestlers with sons and daughters who didn't do well. So you can you can never tell. One of one, them I've had a one guy I won't mention his name came in and I thought this guy was a can't miss. But boy did he miss. And he missed way off the mark. And that happens sometimes. But we're we're human beings so and and you're thrown in especially young human beings when you're 20 years old. Um, God, are you stupid? I was stupid. And everybody's stupid at 22 or 20, 22 years old because you don't know yet. You, you think you do, but you, you really don't know. You can read about history. You can find out what happened before you got here, but it's not the same because once you make it to WWE, or once you get in those doors and once you're in the contract and once you get put in that machine and the, the ball keeps turning. It never stops. It doesn't stop for you. It doesn't stop for anybody else. They, they just will find something else to put in that spot if need be. So um, you, you never know. I mean, you never know who's going to work and who doesn't. Sometimes you take somebody and say, yeah, he, he's not ready, but we can't wait to wait until he's ready. You just got to go and you got to get ready along the way and you got to be ready. It's not about I'm going to get in shape when I get my push. It's about I'm, I'm in shape at all times. You have to be ready at all times. And uh, even the guys who think they're ready or even the guys who look fantastic, um, you have to be consistent. And I've seen some who are and some who aren't. So Randy was. Randy was consistent. And uh, obviously in the younger days, early days, he was a problem child. A lot of us were problem children at that age. And, you know, how how do you react to that? What do you do to solve that? Uh, you can find him. You can talk to him. You can explain the gravity of his uh, gravity and error of his ways. But really, it's up to you. It's up to him. It's up to the talent. So, but Randy was, um, I think, tasting every bit of fruit he could when he got in WWE and uh, he was young, he was ready, he was excited and he's lasted for a good long time. So he had a pretty damn good career. He's still having a good career. And uh, I, I, I thought from the beginning he was going to be uh, a major star and lo and behold, here he is. So when you first get him and bring him in, like a, a he first comes to the studio, I'm always curious, like, are you in the ring with him? Are you actually yeah. wrestling? With, so it's you and him one-on-one. -on -one. Yes. At that time, I definitely was. I was getting in the ring with everybody who came in. That was, that was again, to, to see how they could walk, see how they locked up, uh, see if they could listen. Just, just would you follow my direction, please? I know you have your way of doing it, but see if you can do it this way. And then somebody else might come in if we have a group and see if he could do it that way. But I think, if I'm not mistaken, when Randy came in, we had already moved the developmental system to Louisville. 
and HWA in uh, Cincinnati. So he came in just to see if he uh, was ready to go to Louisville. You know, hey, let's take a look at him in Stanford. Let's get him in the ring while he's here. And, you know, he's going to be here a day, fly out the next day. Let's make the most of the time he's here. Go to the office, talk, show him around. Let's go to the ring, get in the ring, have lunch, have dinner. Uh, then go back and decide. Do we send him to Cincinnati? Do we send him to Louisville? And I believe we sent him to Louisville with Jim Cornette and Danny Davis. And Rip Rogers, by the way. Can't forget Rip. So, no. So you give him the A-OK, -okay, you give him the thumbs up. This guy has something. He just needs some seasoning, basically. Well, basically, yeah. Uh, you don't, at that time, the smart money was don't put somebody like that on TV right away. Let's put him in some matches. Let's get him trained a little bit and acclimated. And then see how he does and you always want to check the attitude you always want to see what the work ethic is and do you know it's the simple things it really really is developmental is not just going in to learn how to work and learn how to wrestle can you be on time do you listen can you follow direction will you come and and do what we ask you to do no questions asked you can ask questions just don't question what we're doing and a lot of times it is a lot of times it is a test and just just for the reaction how are you going to react in developmental because it does reflect uh on how you act on on the main roster or at least that was what the thinking was and of course it's a different animal once you get on the road with raw smackdown and and the crew it it's it's a it's a lot especially for a younger guy and uh, somebody who had been around the business for a while, but also somebody who had these anger, I guess you might call them anger issues or whatever issues he had, they, they don't just stop because now you're training to be a wrestler. They're, they still uh, manifest in your head or wherever you're at. And acting out is just part of the process. And anybody who knows that knows that. And those who don't, don't. And I know that was profound right there, but it's not, man. I mean, it's pretty simple. You got a problem, child. Just because now he's going to be on TV and now he's going to be making a little more money doesn't mean he's not a problem anymore. Doesn't mean he doesn't still have these uh, uh, chips on his shoulder and wants you to knock him off at each chance and ready to jump and ready to be angry at, a, <laughs> at the drop of a hat. So uh, I, I saw none of that in the beginning. But once he got on the road, you know, it is it is a little heady for, for a young guy when you're you're out there and you have all of the uh, evil and good in the world waiting to meet you and greet you and sometimes take you down for the count. And some people do escape it and uh, don't fall into it, but others not so lucky. I feel like the talent relations scouting department, either by luck, like with Orton bringing, you know, his own son bringing him into you, or just finding these guys, Batista, Cena, Lesnar, Orton, kind of all at once is like, okay, guys are onto something here, building for the future. Definitely have some sort of future tent pole guys. Maybe it would, won't be an Austin or a Rock, even though Cena kind of is in that category or yeah. almost in that category for sure. It's like, you know, you have maybe like an undertaker you have your 10 pole guys that you could really build on for the future. So I feel like Orton definitely maybe rising above, but some of those personal issues may have brought him back down to the pack. Uh, yeah, possibly, but you know, uh, let me see, because I've, I've talked about stuff like this before and then, it just goes sideways and, and people mis, misconstrue what I'm saying. It's just not what I'm saying at all, what it, but they don't get that. With, with, with a lot of things uh, back then, on the road, um, on the road today, on the road then, it's, it's still being on the road. It's still the same. And it's, it's just different things happening these days. But you, you gotta you got to think. If you've never flown, or if you've flown just a little bit, if you've never really made these car trips, 
Now suddenly you're getting up at four in the morning, sometimes three, to get your 5 a.m. flight, connect somewhere, go to a town, uh, have to find a rental car, and and do all the necessities. We talked about this before, but the, the rental car, the hotel, get something to eat, go to the gym, go to the building, get out late, drive to the next town or stay over, whichever it is. But either way, you've got to maintain on the road. And you've got to learn how to do it. And as a young guy, especially Bob Orton Jr.'s uh, son, you're going to have a couple of people who do want to mentor you. Or you're going to have the office saying, hey, check on this kid. Make sure he's okay. And uh, show him what to do. Uh, keep him out of trouble. Well, that's great in theory. But what, sometimes when you, you, you get into town just late enough to – to find the last call or somewhere else. And then that, that just starts the whole cycle. Uh, sometimes it ends, but a lot of times it just keeps going. And I think that's what happened to Randy is, you know, you find out that late nights uh, can, can be an interesting time, but it also, when you're up and wired and still ready to go after wrestling and that those are your hours, you know, that that's your daytime. And a lot of people, you know, don't understand. See, it's a nightlife, ain't no good life, but it's my life type thing. And you know, nothing happens good after one or nothing good happens after midnight, right? All, the, all those cliches. So Randy's a good looking guy. He's having stuff thrown at him. He's having all these experiences. He's a big star or he's becoming a big star. And they put him in evolution. They put him in these spots. You know, you got to think. He already has confidence, but he's got a few chips on his shoulder, and he's waiting for you not to knock just one off, but but all ten that he's got stacked up. And he's double dog daring anybody. And with that attitude, you can you can rule the world. But also with that attitude, it could go the other way. And uh, so I think Randy finally, finally learned and grew up, matured, and uh, he's not doing what he did when he was a kid, which, thank God, that's that's what he needed to do, grow up and mature and become the star he is today. And I, I dare to find, I dare you to find me anybody who could tell me Randy Orton is not one of the top wrestlers in the world today because he is. It's funny, too, because if you look at it, he's definitely one of the best workers, probably top tier or top three in WWE, just as far as workers. But you could tell sometimes he's motivated, sometimes he's not. Sometimes he's into it. Sometimes he's not. And I feel like that's been the way he's been through his whole career. Even when he was on the trajectory to get this big push, all of a sudden Triple H gets his hands on him and kind of kills his push a bit. And maybe that unmotivated him a little bit. And then it's like, yeah, oh, yeah, believe me. Uh, yeah, it didn't, doesn't sound like Triple H. Because huh? <laughs> it's like, okay, WrestleMania 25, Orton's got to get the big win. No, Triple H gets the win for God knows what reason. And it was a horrible match. Like, oh, man. Boy. Like, he gets yeah. yeah. So sometimes Triple H gets in there and kind of ruins it. But yeah, I could see Orton being unmotivated at certain points. Yeah, and and I think um, we all go through that at times where you're you're not sure uh, what your motivation is supposed to be because everybody's telling you how great you are, but suddenly you're either taken out or you're uh, beat <laughs> and. Uh, and, and you can't figure it out because it was going the other way. But then, then I think Randy definitely has learned that what we do in the ring is really a small part. And it's the backstage that you really need to be aware of and, and understand where the, manip, manip, man, the manipulation takes place. So um, having done that, he redeemed himself and he redeemed himself with events. He redeemed himself with everybody and, uh, he, he's now, he's been a veteran and a locker room leader for years now. So that's, that's the good thing about it. And that's the good thing. I like to see when guys come in and see where they start out and, and look at where they end up because most of the guys, when they, when they finally figured out and, and enough guys in the locker room also figure, Hey, we don't want to just throw this kid away. We want to try and help him. They, they, they find out real fast who wants to help and who doesn't. And the quickest way, in my opinion, to uh, to burn yourself 
is not accept help. So Randy did, and it, it shows and he continues today to, to be uh, a leader and one of those guys that the young talent can come to and ask for advice because he's done it. He's been there. He's made all the mistakes. He knows what to tell you not to do, and that's that's what you need to I feel like he's one of those invaluable guys you have on your roster that's like, oh, my God, we need a main eventer out of nowhere. Or or right now we need to get this guy Riddle over. Or, hey, let's be tag champs, but we need some good matches here or there, anywhere on the card. Oh, damn, this guy's injured. We need a main event against Lashley or something or, or Big E or something. I feel like he's just, like, invaluable because he can fill in the role and people believe him yeah. as the top guy. There's no doubt about any year that he wrestled. He's, like, automatically a top guy. Yeah, that, that's what you need. You do need credible opponents uh, for you guys you're going to build. And the, the guys who understand, that's their job. And that's that's what, what they should do. Somebody did it for them, so now it's, just, it's their turn. Get somebody else over and help uh, help create new stars. And by getting somebody else over, it doesn't always mean losing. It just help some, get someone else over and put them in that same uh, stratosphere as, as you are and somehow elevate them. So... Uh, it, it really does make sense for what's right for business. But at, at the same time, there are guys who don't want to elevate anybody else. And there are guys who do want to make sure their star is above everybody else's. And and then you we find out what we uh, arrive at uh, when we get there. Sometimes it isn't always good. But, again, that, that's part of the process. That's part of the journey. And, and – uh, Everybody comes across it one way or another, and they deal with it as they do, and it shows in what they do uh, for the rest of their career, I guess. Look at Orton's career, though. It's just nuts. 14-time WB champion, and he's still in great shape, and that number could yeah. go up. IC champion, U.S. champion, three-time tag champ, Money in the Bank winner, two-time Royal Rumble winner. I mean, what a run, what a career, what a legacy for Orton. And he's not done yet. He's still in awesome shape. Yeah, he is still in awesome shape. And I think it's, uh, again, a testament to Bob Orton Jr. was um, Bob Orton Jr. was a hell of a uh, performer, hell of a talent his entire career. I saw him early on in Houston, Bob Orton Jr. And I remember seeing his dad also uh, wrestle – in Houston a few years before Junior got there. And I'll never forget this because Bob turned into one of the greatest promo guys ever. But Paul Bosch was interviewing uh, Bob on TV, Bob Orton Jr., and he was stuttering. Bob couldn't help but stutter. He was terrified. And I thought, oh, gosh, this can't be. And then year, years later, um, you hear promos and, and you would watch him and, and he turned into an excellent worker, excellent promo guy. So though that, that's, that in itself shows you what, uh, getting out on the road and experience could help you with and teach you with. And, and back then the guys would help, especially out of respect for Bob Orton senior. And I think the same thing happened with Randy out of respect for his dad who headlined, uh, the first main event. Or, or sorry, the first WrestleMania uh, and main event. They they have respect for Bob Jr. They ought to have respect for his son too. Until they show, until Randy shows them a reason not to. And uh, every time I was around him, he was great. Randy was always great. Even when I'd go to Louisville, it was it was always cool because I think he remembered uh, that I was a guy that got in the ring with him the very first time, and he was awesome. Just just. Really an awesome person. People can say what they want, but I can, again, I can only judge people by the way they were around me. And he was great. Fantastic. And, I, and I, I'm glad he got his life together. I'm glad uh, he has his family. And I'm glad he has something that he can go back to after the road. Because that a lot of it is being on the road and boredom or just having to, to stay occupied, having to be in the mix and awake the entire time just, just to make sure you don't miss something um, can be intoxicating. But having a family at the end of it, it's just something I've learned 
in my later years, because I didn't need anybody. I don't want to live with anybody. I hate the world. I'm okay by myself. Well, you find out it's actually not too bad having somebody you like being around. So I'm glad he's, he's found that. His, his kids, his wife, and I think he has a, a really good thing at home. So uh, when he goes out on the road, he has a purpose. And it's not just about him anymore. And that's that's the good thing. I think that's a that might have been one of the things that, that certainly helped him go down a straighter road than he had been before. For sure. Yeah, and I think that's a, a great stopping point for this week. And let's talk about your book, a pro wrestling curriculum, advice, suggestions, and stories to help the aspiring pro get to the next level. Where can they get this awesome book? John, they can get that awesome book at jpwrestlingacademy.com. It also has, I believe, the first date of our 2022 session coming up, uh, which will be January 3rd through March 25th, 2022. But you can check out jpwrestlingacademy.com on the front page. You can order my curriculum. Love it. And also go to Pro Wrestling Tees, Pro Wrestling Tees.com. You can get a JPWA shirt or you can get a Dr. Tom Pritchard shirt. I love the Wanted Dead or Alive shirt. Like you mentioned, check out your website. You can also check out my website, TMPTEmpire.com. And of course, follow Dr. Tom on Twitter at Dr. Tom Pritchard. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Two Man Power Trip. Dr. Tom, what else you got going on? Uh, well, uh, we're, we're doing our uh, last class of 2021 right now in JPWA, but. <laughs> WrestleCade, Winston-Salem is coming up the day after Thanksgiving, man. I can't wait for that. That's going to be a hell of a day. Hell of a, hell of a weekend. It really is. And Stan the Man will be with you. Nice. Well, is Stan going to be there? I believe I saw him on there. I don't know if you guys are technically together, but that uh, would be nice if you get the photo up together. You know, they have No, nah, that would be. That would be, but I think I'm coming in for someone separate. I don't, I, I don't know. There, it's... it's uh, it's been, it's been a crazy week, I can tell you that. But but that's no excuse. I I, I I'm sure if he's there, we'll we'll hook up. Yeah, you got to get that together for yeah. sure. But Definitely. I'd like to thank everybody out there for listening. We'll see you right back here next week for a little taking into school with Doctor Tom Bridger. See you next.